Patriots history here. We are reading through a Patriots history of the United States from cover to cover, from, as it were, Columbus to Trump. And uh, <clears throat> we are actually starting Chapter 2. Uh, I just started Chapter 2 last time, and so I'll um, <clears throat> begin there. <clears throat> Still have a little bit of that cold left. So I'm going to be a little bit hoarse from time to time. Now, <clears throat> it's important, as always, that you know that I'm reading from the 15th anniversary edition of Patriots History of the United States. If you have an earlier edition, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it will be roughly the same, but not entirely the same. So you might have to hunt around for where we are. So I am starting on page... 43, and the heading is <clears throat> Shaping Americanness. Shaping Americanness. In Democracy in America, get a little more light here. I know it doesn't make me look great, but in Democracy in America, the brilliant French observer Alexis de Tocqueville predicted that a highly refined culture was unlikely to evolve in America largely because of, quote, lowly colonial origins. The, quote, intermingling of classes and constant rising and sinking, unquote, of individuals in an egalitarian society, Tocqueville wrote, <clears throat> had a detrimental effect on the arts, literature, painting, music, theater, education. In place of high or refined mores, Tocqueville concluded, Americans had built a demo democratic culture that was highly accessible but ultimately lacking in the brilliance that characterized the European art forms. <clears throat> Certainly, some colonial Americans tried to emulate Europe, particularly when it came to creating institutions of higher learning. Harvard College, founded in 1636, was followed by William and Mary, Anglicans, 1693, <clears throat> Yale, Congregationalists, 1701, Princeton, New Light Presbyterian, 1746, College of Philadelphia, University of Philadelphia, now 14, I'm sorry, 1749, and between 1764 and 1769, King's College, which was Anglican and became Columbia, Brown, which was Baptist, <coughs> Queen's College, which was Dutch Reformed, became Rutgers, and Dartmouth, Congregational, America had rapidly caught the Europeans, where a state such as Germany only had a dozen major universities by mid-decade. And from the beginning, these schools differed sharply from their European progenitors in that they were founded by a variety of Protestant sects, not a state church. And though tied to religious denominations, they were nevertheless relatively secular. Harvard, for example, was founded to train clergy, yet by the end of the colonial era, only a quarter of its graduates became ministers, and the rest pursued careers in business, law, medicine, politics, and teaching. A few schools, such as the College of New Jersey, later Princeton, led by the Reverend John Witherspoon, bucked the trend. <clears throat> Witherspoon transformed Princeton into a campus much more oriented toward religious and moral philosophy, all the while charging it with a powerful revolutionary fervor. So again, very important. All, all of America's early universities were attached to a religious denomination, <clears throat> and most of them had as their goal to train ministers or to educate people to be better Christians. <clears throat> Witherspoon's Princeton was swimming against the tide, however. Not only were most curricula becoming more secular, but they were also more down-to-earth and applied. Colonial colleges slighted the, de the dead languages, 
Latin, and Greek by introducing French and German. Modern historical studies complemented and sometimes replaced ancient history. The proliferation of colleges, nine in America, meant access for more middle-class youths, such as John Adams, a Massachusetts farm boy who studied at Harvard. To complete this democratization process, appointed boards of trustees, not the faculty or the church, governed American universities. So we are on page, <coughs> excuse me, page 44 now. Early American science also reflected the struggles faced by those who sought a more pragmatic knowledge. For example, John Winthrop Jr., the son of the Massachusetts founder, struggled in vain to conduct pure research and bring his scientific career to the attention of European intellectual community. As the first American member of the Royal Society of London, Winthrop wrote countless letters abroad and even sent specimens of rattlesnakes and other indigenous American flora and fauna, which received barely a passing glance from the European scientists. And of course, they are, <coughs> excuse me, they're very smug and they're very uh, elitist in looking at us ridiculous Americans. What can we possibly know? More successful was Benjamin Franklin, the American scientist who applied his research in meteorology and electricity to invent the, the lightning rod as well as bifocals in the Franklin stove. Americans wanted the kind of science that would heat their homes and improve their eyesight, not explain the origins of life in the universe. <clears throat> in many ways, Franklin, 1706 to 90, became the face of America in pre-revolutionary times. His scientific experiments were well known in Europe where Jacques Turgot gushed, quote, he snatched lightning from the sky and the scepter from the tyrants, unquote. Later though, as a diplomat, he played on French perceptions of him as a half bumpkin, half aristocrat to cultivate favors and funds. Apprenticed to his brother in the printing trade at age 12, he, Franklin, learned the business and wrote to a, under a pseudonym, quote, Mrs. Silence Duguid. He worked his way at the printing trade early in 1700s, ultimately publishing the Philadelphia Gazette and became a successful author with Poor Richard's Almanac, first published in 1733. Poor Richard's Almanac was a written magazine featuring weather forecasts, crop advice, predictions, and premonitions, witticisms, and folksy advice on how to succeed and live virtuously. <clears throat> His print business and book sales made him wealthy. One at a time, Franklin made an, I'm sorry, at one time, Franklin made an annual income of 2,000 pounds, when the wealthiest attorney in Philadelphia made only 20 pounds per year, despite the fact that he refused to patent his many inventions. Upon retiring from printing in 1748, Franklin pursued science, music, oceanography, chess, and other endeavors before being drawn inexorably into politics. Although he hoped for a peaceful solution with England, his publication of Letters of Thomas Hutchison in 1773 advocating a crackdown on the Bostonians, fueled colonial indignation. I should add, Franklin becomes the wealthiest man in the colonies at about this time. <clears throat> no one knows exactly how much wealth he had, but it's thought he was wealthier than most planters. <clears throat> in part, Franklin's legend lived on well after that the other founders because his autobiography became a classic example of the American penchant for pragmatic literature that continues to this day. He wrote his autobiography during the pre-revolutionary era, though it was not published until the 19th century. Several generations of American school children grew up on the tales of his youthful adventures 
an early career culminating with his gaining fame as a Philadelphia printer, writer, scientist, diplomat, and patriot <clears throat> politician. Franklin's 13 virtues, honesty, thrift, devotion, faithfulness, trust, courtesy, cleanliness, temperance, work, humility, and so on, constituted a list of personal traits that aspired to by virtually every Puritan, that were aspired to by virtually every Puritan, by every Puritan, Quaker, or Catholic in the colonies. Sorry. Franklin's saga thereby became the first major work in literary genre that would define Americanism, the rags-to-riches story, the self-improvement guide rolled into one. Single-handedly, Franklin seemed to prove wrong French intellectual Abbe Reynal, who wrote in 1770 and would write, America has not yet produced a good poet, an able mathematician, one man of genius in a single art or single science. <clears throat> Jefferson, it should be noted, was already an accomplished biologist and botanist. Franklin whether through practical science, homespun advice in poor Richard's almanac, or his humble origins, emerged as the best known and most admired American. Commoners could relate to him, foreigners respected him, and most American leaders appreciated him, though he made notable enemies in his lifetime. <clears throat> the practicality he exhibited typified American colonial art, architecture, drama, and music spawn in a frontier environment. Perhaps it was not a coincidence that the great painter, Benjamin West, Franklin's friend, painted the great scientist holding his key on a kite line during an electrical storm. You all know this painting. I'm sure you've seen it. <clears throat> like West, most artists found their only market for paintings in portraiture, and later in patriot art. Talented painters such as John Singleton Copley in, and Benjamin West made their living painting the likenesses of colonial merchants, planters, and their families. Eventually, both sailed for Europe to pursue artistic endeavors. American architecture never soared to magnificence Though a few public buildings, colleges, churches, and private homes reflected an ascetic influence by classical motifs <clears throat> and Georgian styles. Drama, too, struggled. Puritan Massachusetts prohibited theater shows, the Devil's Workshop, whereas thespians in Philadelphia, Williamsburg, and Charleston preferred amateurish productions of Shakespeare and contemporary English dramas. Not until the royal Tyler tapped the patriot theme and the comic potential of the Yankee archetype in his 1789 production of The Contrast would American playwrights finally discover their, their niche somewhere between high and low art. <clears throat> in 18th century Charleston, Boston, Philadelphia, the upper classes would occasionally hear Handel and Mozart performed by professional orchestras. Most musical endeavors, however, were applied to religion where the church hymns were sung a cappella and occasionally to the accompaniment of a church organ. How different from today, right? Americans customized and syncopated hymns greatly aggravating pious English churchmen, reflecting the most predominant musical influence in, in uh, colonial America, the folk hymn of Anglo-Celtic and African immigrants. American music had already coalesced into a base upon which new genres of church and secular music, gospel, field songs, and white folk ballads would ultimately emerge and could be found in the surviving sheet music of many founders, including George Washington. It's interesting that <clears throat> in the music found at Mount Vernon, there were, of course, the 
um, Brahms and Bach and the kind of the standards, the Mozart and Handel kind of things. <clears throat> but you also found a great number of Scots-Irish folk tunes. And this was significant because it meant George Washington was a rock and roller. That was the rock and roll of the day, the Irish folk tunes. So um, Washington couldn't sing, apparently, but was a pretty good dancer. And he liked to dance to these and other uh, pieces of music, including Virginia Reels. The reel was um, the dance of the low folk. Dance of highest folk was the minuet. Dance of the next strata would be a waltz. And the reel, that, that was for common people, ordinary scum. But Washington liked it. <clears throat> Colonial literature, likewise, survived on religious or otherwise addressed, focused on religious or otherwise addressed the needs of the common folk. The pattern was set with Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation, which related the exciting story of the pilgrims with an eye toward the all-powerful role of God in shaping their destiny. Anne Bradstreet, who accomplished 17th century colonial poet, who continued to be popular after her death, also conveyed religious themes and emphasized divine inspiration of human events. <clears throat> Although literacy was widespread, Americans read mainly the Bible, political tracts, and how-to books on farming, mechanics, and moral improvements, not Greek philosophers or the campaigns of Caesar. In short, the American culture developed was quite different from that of England's. We are a very practical people. If you can't show me how it improves my life, I'm not interested. <clears throat> and to see this today, all you have to do is look at books such as Chicken Soup for the Soul, these massive best-selling series that are self-improvement books or um, books by Norman Vincent Peale, for example, or um, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, right? How many Get Rich Quick books are there today? Uh, Real Estate and One Easy Lesson, something like this. <clears throat> the uh, salesmen such as Zig Ziglar or Oz Mandingo, uh, are constant bestsellers because they're giving Americans a way to access a rather complicated notion of making money through the stock market or investments. So this is an ongoing practice <clears throat> with Americans. Common life in the early 18th century. Life in colonial America was as coarse as the physical environment in which it flourished, so much so that English visitors expressed a shock at the extent to which immigrants had been transformed in the New World. Many Americans lived in one-bedroom farmhouses heated only by a Franklin stove with clothes hung on wall pegs and very few furnishings. <clears throat> Father's chair was often the only genuine chair in the room with children relegated to rough benches or rugs thrown on wooden floors. <clears throat> you get an idea of this in the movie The Patriot, which of course is much later. We're looking now over 100 years later and we're looking at a guy who was much wealthier, not a very common colonial, but still he had his rocking chair and the kids would often sit on the floor. The rugged lifestyle was routinely misunderstood by visitors as Indianization. Yet in most cases, the process was subtle. Trappers had already adopted moccasins, buckskins, and furs, and adapted Indian methods of hauling hides or goods over rough terrain with the trevo, a triangular-shaped and easily constructed sled pulled by a single horse. Indians likewise adopted white tools, firearms, alcohol, and even accepted English religion, making the acculturization process entirely reciprocal. Non-Indians incorporated Indian words, especially proper names, into American English 
and adopted aspects of Indian material culture. So I may have done this before, <clears throat> but let me just go over this one part again because it's really pretty amazing. Um, all right. I'm reading from <clears throat> Paul Johnson and his great book, Birth of the Modern. And he discusses in this the uh, rise of English words, English languages. He notes that the English already were adopting a kind of um, affinity for Americans. Lord Byron uh, had phrases that were very Americanized. Uh, John Stuart, James Mill, a radical who worked at India House, wrote, when I came to the American War, I took my part like a child I was until set right by my father on the wrong side because it was called the English side. That is, they came to even support the Americans. Lord Byron had similar ideas planted in his mind by his pro progressive-minded mother. Um, so let's see if we can get to some of these words. <clears throat> Okay, so Americans constantly added to their own neologisms or adoptions <clears throat> from half a dozen tongues. Cocktail dates from 1806. In 1822, a Kentucky breakfast was defined as three cocktails and a chaw of tobacco. Barroom came into vogue in 1807, mint julep in 1809, <clears throat> a long drink in 1828. Already Americans had borrowed words such as boss from the Dutch, depot, rapids, prairie, shanty, chute, cash, crevasse from the French, mustang, ranch, sombrero, patio, corral, lasso, from the Spanish. English words such as talented, which were obsolete in England, were used in America. German words such as dumb for stupid were adopted. Negro words and phrases such as caucus, mass meeting, campfire meeting were used. There were settlers' words such as lot, squatter, also, a beginning of a talent for euphemism, such as help, which is the democratic term for servant. We have hired help. The English would say we have servants. Um, as the U.S. expanded across the continent, we added words such as portage, raccoon, grizzly bear, backtrack, medicine man, huckleberry, War party, running time, overnight, overall, rattlesnake, bowery, moose. And then we added new variations to existing English words, <clears throat> such as snag, to snag a wife, stone, suit, it suits you, bar, a bar, could be a metal or wooden rod, <clears throat> it could be a saloon, or it could be the act of preventing someone from doing something. You barred them from entering. Later still, the bar became the practice of law. So you see how we continue to use these words. Brand. Well, you brand a cow, but Levi's is a brand, okay? Bluff, bluff is high ground, but in American it also became to fake someone out. Fix, hump, knob, creek, settlement. And Americans also added various phrases. Did you know it was the Americans, not the English, who came up with keep a stiff upper lip? 
fly off the handle, get religion, knock down, drag out, fight. On the fence, in cahoots, horse sense, barking up the wrong tree. Plus a, reli- a, a whole variety of less expressions such as hold on, let on, no two ways about it, cave in, flunk out, stave off, get the hang of a thing, go to a campfire meeting, Okay, um, <clears throat> even today, it's quite interesting that um, Americans, more than other people, adapt the name of the leading product as that of all products. So if you have a headache, you reach for an aspirin, but aspirin is the brand name, the product name from Bayer, okay? <clears throat> if you put on pants made out of certain material, you put on Levi's. But other makers make Levi's, but we all wear Levi's, okay? <clears throat> if you have a runny nose, you reach for a Kleenex, not a tissue, a Kleenex. In the 1990s, If you were jogging and you took your music with you, you had a little black box that had a cassette tape in it, usually called a Walkman. Now, other people made Walkmans, but they're all Walkmans. All of you have an iPhone, but mine happens to be an Android, but they're all iPhones. So um, even if you go to copy something, you go to make a... Xerox. Isn't that interesting? Um, We also began over time, all this dates back to this early colonial period where we started to Americanize the entire language and basically say, we will not conform ourselves to establish rules and precedents and meanings. We're going to make up our own meanings. We're going to use our own rules. So, You see this with the writer E. E. Cummings, lowercase e, lowercase e, lowercase c, Cummings, no periods after the E and E. Um, George Carlin, one of our greatest ever comedians, did about a three-minute skit called The Modern Man, where he talks about life in the slow lane, but he's, he's uploaded, he's downloaded, you know, he goes through all of the phrases that we use uh, in our modern life, you know, warp speed and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and so I have brought this among uh, my own writings to include made up word phrases like spatter bucket, slick dickle, stutter pucket, flam dambler, I mean, you know, squid pickle, <laughs> pod scooper. <laughs> anal polyp I mean it, it, whatever words you want to use that work are American they come to us from the American tradition of using whatever works whatever makes the point okay the rugged lifestyle let's see um Okay, non-Indians incorporated Indian words, especially proper names, into American English and adopted aspects of Indian material culture. They smoked tobacco, grew and ate squash and beans, dried venison into jerky, boiled lobster, served them up with wild rice or potatoes on the side. British Americans cleared heavily forested land by girdling trees, then slashing and burning the dead timber. Practices all picked up from the Indians, despite the myth of the ecologically friendly Indians. Whites copied Indians in traveling via snowshoes, bull boat, dugout canoe, and as noted, colonial Americans learned quickly through harsh experiences how to fight like the Indians when circumstances called for. 
Even while Indianizing their language, British colonists also adopted French, Spanish, German, Dutch, African words from the areas where those languages were spoken, creating still new regional accents that evolved in New England and in the southern tidewater. Still there today. The southern accent still there. Environment also influenced accents, pro producing the flat, unmelodic, understated, and functional Midland American drawl that Europeans found incomprehensible. Americans prided themselves on innovative spellings, stripping the excess baggage off English words, exchanging color, C-O-L-O-R, for color, C-O-L-O-U-R, labor, L-A-B-O-R, for labor, L-A-B-O-U-R. In other words, we simplified the language. Why do you need the extra U? You don't get rid of it. We simplified this language. <clears throat> Otherwise, we respelled words in harder American syllables, such as theater, T-H-E-R for theater, T-H-R-E. This new brand of English was so different that around the time of the American Revolution, a young New Englander named Noel Webster began work on a dictionary of American English, which he completed in 1828. Only a small number of colonial Americans went on to college, often in Great Britain, but increasing numbers studied at public and private elementary schools, raising the most literate population on earth. The intent was to have the localities pay for schools, which would instruct children in the basics of mathematics, grammar, and history. The three R's, read and write and arithmetic. <clears throat> Americans' literacy was widespread, but it was not as deep or profound. Most folks read a little and not much more. In response, a new form of publishing arose to meet the demands of this vast but minimally literate population, the newspaper. It's also interesting that comic books take off in America before they do in Europe or anywhere else. And that's yet another more simplified version of books, right? Um, I learned to read the classics by reading comic books called Classics Illustrated. And they would do The Last of the Mohicans or Moby Dick, but they would have pictures. And they would have, of course, part of the literature, but not all of it. And, and it was a way for uh, young people who didn't want to sit down with a thick book to get the gist of the classics, and so I can make references today, even though finally I did read Moby Dick. It was horrible. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Two-thirds of the book is How You Whale. It's literally the, the um, physical process of whaling. And only about one-third of the book is the story of Ahab and the white whale. Anyway, <clears throat> but I eventually read that. But I haven't read many of the others. I skimmed Last of the Mohicans, uh, Natty Bumpo, these kinds of things. <clears throat> Never read House of the Seven Gables. But I, I skimmed and read Classic Illustrated, Last of the Mohicans, and of course watched the movie. So we get a lot of our shared culture through movies later in life. You can say it's a bad thing, that's a good thing, movies aren't the same as the book. you got to love literature to love to read. And, and so it, it's just as simple as that. Americans' literacy was widespread. Let's say I did that. Early newspapers came in the form of broadsides, usually distributed and posted in the lobby of an inn or saloon where one of the more literate colonials would proceed to read the story aloud for the dining and drinking clientele. And by the way, people would make comments as you read to everyone. Um, so take Mrs. O'Leary and the cow that kicked over the lantern in the barn and started the Chicago fire. <clears throat> Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern and started a fire in her barn. It burned the barn to the ground. Mrs. O'Leary said, I'll never recover. And somebody in the audience would pipe up and say, 
Oh, that's nonsense. She burned that barn down twice and we rebuilt it for her twice. I assume we're going to do it again once in a while. So you get commentary much as you do, right, with the comments at the bottom of many of the news pages today that so many of them are now taking away because they don't like the comments because the comments don't reflect what they in their news are foisting on people. So this is a very old American tradition. It goes back to the beginning of broadsides. Colonial newspapers contained a certain amount of local information about fires, public drunkenness, arrests, and political events. More of a National Enquirer, really. More closely resembling today's National Enquirer than the New York Times. All right. I have about three more paragraphs to get to the next section on the Great Awakening, but given the status of my voice today, I think this is a pretty good place to stop. And let me remind you, all of these are archived on Wild World of History channel, and um, I have a VIP service that has four ongoing video lesson programs at the Wild World of History, including the Horrible History of Howard Zinn, the 1620 default with about 11 videos where I explain why the 16, I'm sorry, 1620 default where I explain why the 1619 project is wrong and we should date American exceptionalism from 1620 and the Pilgrims. I have a 21 video series on Reagan, the American president. I have one on enduring lessons on life and citizenship where I go into such things as time and money. What's the connection between time and money? Well, remember last time? We talked about this last time, how uh, physical money is merely a physical manifestation of your time, talent, and energy. And once young people understand that, they will have a great more appreciation for the value of money, what it is and what it means to spend it and to buy. Because when you're buying something, say, Paul Johnson's book, you are literally exchanging your time, talent, and energy for Paul Johnson's time, talent, and energy. And I think this will have an effect on people, young people, as to why <clears throat> they might be less likely to just steal music off the Internet if they understand that money is an exchange of time, talent, and energy for someone else's time, talent, and energy. And that music you just stole doesn't reflect a big corporate media. It reflects musicians' time, talent, and energy. And you just stole from them. Anyway, that's my opinion. Remember, we are trying to make Patriots History of the United States into a video series. And to do that, we're going through the process for now a Buy Larry a Coffee. So look around on the website for the Buy Larry a Coffee button. If you can't find it, email me at larry at wildworldofhistory.com. I'll send you the trailer to Patriots History and the Buy Me a Coffee link. You won't want to miss this. This trailer is incredible. We put it together with music from Michael W. Smith, music called Freedom. It's absolutely unbelievable. And we can make this into a video series. We can get the first episode out in less than 12 months. I've got the crew ready to go. All I need is the cheddar, the money, the cash, the moolah. So look on the site, find Buy Larry a Coffee. If you can't find it, just email me at larry at wildworldofhistory.com. We also have some ongoing book deals. Our book offer of Patriots History and Patriots History Reader for $89. Uh, autographed and shipped to you. We have the presidential package that is Patriots History, Reagan the American President, and Dragon Slayers. And we have a very large all, all Larry All the Time package of all the books that I never talk about or advertise. You might want to look at those. So all that's available at the Wild World of History. And coming up here in about 20 minutes, 15 minutes, I'll be doing Talking Politics over at the Wild World of Politics site. If you go over to the Wild World of Politics, there's a thing with Zoom links, and just hit today's Zoom link, and you'll see me over there in about 15 minutes. So I will see you guys back here Monday, and hopefully my voice will be better.